In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts and minds of the people of God in the Catholic Church, so that this synodal process may be a time of growth in obedience to Christ and service of the gospel. Grant us all an attentive spirit, so that we may truly listen to your prompting and to one another. May our leaders in parish, diocese, national conferences, and the Synod in Rome have the wisdom and the humility to attend to all the diverse voices and to discern with us the way forward. Grant that at all times we may recognize the good faith of those with whom we disagree most strongly and that we always remember that the grace of God is in courtesy. Amen. So greetings everyone and thank you again for being here. We move now into the third session, the last session of our reflection. And the slide that I've given there is deliberately reflects the synodal path. Those of you who have been to Rome will recognize in the center the Appian Way that leads out of and back into Rome. And in a way, that's what will be happening across the church as Rome speaks to us and across the church and we speak back to Rome and to one another. It's a polyhedron, as uh, Francis keeps saying, by which we all listen to and work with one another. And you have on the top left nomads. And whether we like it or not, we are a pilgrim church. And the others on the right, you'll probably recognize as Pope Francis in movement and bishops in prayer. So at the end of the second talk about synods and synodality on the 13th of October, I quoted from Pope Francis's speech commemorating the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops. From the beginning of my ministry as Bishop of Rome, he said, I have sought to enhance the Synod, which is one of the most precious legacies of the Second Vatican Council. And we must continue along this path. It is precisely this path of synodality which God expects of the church in the third millennium. That's a powerful statement. That is his belief in the way God is calling us as we move forward and seek to respond to his Holy Spirit. Now, those of you who have kindly taken part in these MBIT sessions on the 6th and 13th of this month will remember that I have suggested that at this point in the history of the church, we have been witnessing from the early 1960s up to the present, a papacy in transition. Within a church, the entire people of God, as Roberta just said, that has been and remains in a particularly intense period of transition. <clears throat> now, such transitions bring painful tensions and loud disagreements, choppy waters that are not at all easy to navigate. In my first talk on the 6th of September, October, I spoke of the years following the First Vatican Council in which the loss of equilibrium between the hierarchical and community aspects of the church was only too evident. The relationship between the hierarchical ministry and the community of the baptized as a whole, and between the ecclesia docens or teaching church and ecclesia decens or learning church appeared as a dichotomy, as an almost unbridgeable gap, rather than exemplifying the indissoluble unity of the Christian community. As the great Dominican theologian Yves Congar, who had such an impact on the Second Vatican Council, as he said, he referred to the church in that way as a, as a hierarchology. The emphasis on authority in this view led to a focus on a relationship of superiority and subordination. And as you see in the slide, a focus on the elements of separation in ecclesiastical structures. And what is meant by the phrase superiority subordination 
is vividly illustrated in the encyclical of Pope Pius X, Vehementonos of 1906. I quote, therefore, this society, that's the church, is of necessity and by its nature unequal. That is a society comprising two categories of persons, the pastors and the flock, those who occupy a rank in the different degrees of the hierarchy and the multitude of the faithful. And so distinct are these two categories that with the pastors alone rest the necessary right and authority to move and direct all the members towards the end of the society. And listen to this. The one duty of the multitude, he said, is to accept that they are governed and to follow obediently the guidance of the pastors. Last month on the 18th of September, 115 years after Pius X's encyclical, you know, Pius was a saint. That doesn't mean he was always right. 115 years after Pius X's encyclical, Pope Francis addressed 1,000 or so representatives from the Diocese of Rome, that's bishops, clergy, women and men religious, and members of the laity, in the Paul VI audience hall. I've come here to encourage you to take this synodal process seriously, he told them, and to tell you that the Holy Spirit needs you. Listen to him. Listen to each other. Do not leave anyone out. Francis stressed that the diocesan phase of this synodal process is really and truly important because it makes possible to listen to all the baptized. That's his aim. And then note this contrast to what I read earlier. There is a considerable resistance, he said, to overcoming the image of a church where there is a rigid separation between superiors and subordinates, between the one who teaches and the one who learns. Walking together, on the other hand, reveals a way that is horizontal rather than vertical. We pastors, he added, walk with the people, sometimes ahead, sometimes in the midst, sometimes behind. The good shepherd should go forward in that way, ahead to guide, in the midst to encourage, and behind, because, and this is a lovely phrase, because the sheep have the nose, that's the capacity, to find new paths for the journey or to rediscover paths that have been lost. A very different view. As we can see from the contrast between the approaches of two popes at different moments of history, the papacy, like the church itself, is not immutable. It is capable of change without losing its identity or its continuity with the past. <clears throat> and that phrase, continuity with the past, reminds us the papacy is among the oldest if not the oldest, of continuous human institutions, continuous human institutions. You know, the Roman Empire was only recently born when the early popes took their place on the chair of St. Peter. In the light of our synodality theme, the person of Pope Paul VI comes clearly to mind. The path on which the church is now embarked emerged from the Second Vatican Council, which itself was one of the most important experiences of conciliarity or synodality since the great councils of the first millennium. And we were fortunate at Vatican II to have had a Pope, Paul VI, who had the wisdom and courage to discern and accept, even if very cautiously, that a renewal of the synodal path was necessary in the Catholic Church. And when I say the Catholic Church, I am at the same time deeply convinced that the renewed take-up of synodality emerging from Vatican II could, as it develops in the course of time, be of enormous importance for the further and deeper development of ecumenical relationships among the Christian churches and communities 
around the world, moving us towards greater unity, even if the form that such unity could or should take is probably beyond our capacity to visualize at this point in time. In Jorge Mario Bergoglio, we now have a Pope who is convinced that it is necessary to develop synods and synodality much further. At a point in history, says Francis, when the church is embarking upon a new chapter of evangelization, requiring her to be throughout the world permanently in a state of mission, the Synod of Bishops is called, like every other ecclesiastical institution, to become ever more suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. You know, Francis has taken up the challenge of synodality with an openness to the future that is deeply rooted in his hope in God. And the word hope in that phrase is important. In his interview with Antonio Spadaro in August 2013, Pope Francis responded to the question, how can we be optimistic in a world in crisis? He replied, I don't like to use the word optimism because it refers to a psychological state. I prefer to use the word hope instead, according to what we read in the letters of the Hebrews chapter 11. Christian hope does not deceive. It is a theological virtue and therefore ultimately a gift from God that cannot be reduced to optimism, which is only human. God does not mislead hope. God cannot deny himself. God is all promise. In that same interview, Francis described how he had come to recognize the importance of consultation. Consultation being fundamental to the way he sees synodality. Reflecting on his earlier life as provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina at the young age of 36, he admitted openly, he said, my authoritarian and quick manner of making decisions created serious problems. Over time, I learned many things and the Lord has allowed this growth in knowledge of government through my faults and my sins. Francis described to Spadaro how later as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he had a meeting with his six auxiliary bishops every six weeks and several times a year with the Council of Priests. They asked questions and we opened the floor for discussion. And this really helped me to make the best decisions. But nowadays, I hear some people tell me, do not consult too much, decide by yourself. Instead, he said, I believe that consultation is very important. Now, the relevance of the, the, relevance of the slide you see before you to synodality and the importance of consultation in the synodal process might not and quite reasonably be immediately clear. And yet it relates profoundly to both. The slide deliberately points, even if there's not time to develop the theme this evening, to the significance and importance of the Latin American church for the universal church especially in these first 20 or more years of the third millennium. At upper left, we have the very large Basilica of Aparecida in Brazil. And on the lower right, we have a photo you've seen before of Latin American bishops in 2007 at the fifth plenary meeting of Selam, that is the Council of the Bishops of Latin America and the Caribbean. And you can see Cardinal Bergoglio in the front row third from the right, and the arrow picks him out. It's widely known that Cardinal Bergoglio came second in the voting in the conclave of 2005 that elected Cardinal Ratzinger as Pope Benedict XVI. At that time, Bergoglio had pleaded with those who were voting for him not to vote for him, but to put their votes behind Ratzinger and thus avoid 
giving the impression of division in the church. As you can imagine, it was with relief that he returned to Buenos Aires after the conclave. But as he said at a meeting in Peru a month later, he felt that it was time for the Latin American continent, to quote him, to lend a service to the universal church and to share the gifts that the Holy Spirit had showered on its people. And this led to the very successful meeting there in Aparecida two years later, a continental meeting that was genuinely synodal in style, both in the consultation process throughout Latin America, obviously with ups and downs here and there, as all consultations, sometimes better, sometimes less, but good, and also synodality in the meeting itself. Now, this experience of Aparecida's synodal style is one of the things that Francis brought with him to the papacy. We often neglect or are not aware of the importance of the Latin American church for the rest of the church. But there's another unexpected aspect of all this. And Austin Ivory is one of those who's pointed this out. And this is that Benedict XVI, the man who had provided theological justification for Vatican centralism in the 1980s and 1990s, put his strong backing behind this Selam meeting at Aparecida. And Benedict did this against the advice of some of his closest Vatican advisors. In the words of none other than Gustavo Gutierrez, one of the leading proponents in the early days of liberation theology, Gutierrez said, Aparecida mostly happened thanks to Ratzinger. As you can see, there's much to reflect upon and pray about in that extraordinary development. If nothing else, it points to the wisdom of our not making judgments too quickly and superficially. Who could have guessed, remembering Cardinal Ratzinger's opposition to much of liberation theology in the early 1980s, that as Pope, he would support and encourage Aparecida? To return to our earlier discourse, Pope Francis stated plainly that the consistories of cardinals and the synods of bishops are important places to make real and active consultation. We must, however, he said, give them a less rigid form. I do not want token consultation. As he says in the slide there, I want to see real, not ceremonial consultation. On a personal note, I would add that as dioceses around the world begin to take up the challenge of the synodal process, and it's great to see in our country and other places that they are, it is essential that diocesan consultation should be as honest as possible, not a form of window dressing. In the apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, which he published in November 2013, and which he described as Francis as indicating a program for his pontificate, he made clear that consultation meant that he too must be concerned with the conversion of the papacy. It is my duty as the Bishop of Rome, he said, to be open to suggestions which can help make the exercise of my ministry more faithful to the meaning which Jesus Christ wished to give it and to the present needs of evangelization. Pope John Paul II, and it's significant that he quoted John Paul II here, John Paul asked for help in finding, to quote, a way of exercising the primacy, which while in no way renouncing what is essential to its mission, is nonetheless open to a new situation. Pope Francis then stated bluntly, we have made little progress in this regard. The papacy and the central structures of the universal church also need to hear the call to pastoral conversion. And as I look back at the initiatives and words of Pope Francis over the last eight years, I've become convinced that while he sees structural change as important, he considers 
such change, as you see in the slide, to be at the service of the development of participation within the church. Development of participation through the church is key to understanding how and why Francis prepared and arranged the first synod of his pontificate. That synod was in fact more in the nature of a synod in two acts. The focus chosen for the synod was the vocation and mission of the family in the church in the modern world. However, instead of following the rhythm that had become customary in the synod of bishops called by his predecessors, Francis chose an approach that would do two things. Firstly, an approach that would bring problem areas and issues up to the surface rather than leaving them to lie buried and out of sight. Secondly, an approach that would thereby achieve wide and deep discussion and consultation on those issues right across the worldwide church. This was very different to the way the synods of bishops had been conducted up to that point. Francis said about doing this by making this entire family synod a two-stage process, an extraordinary synod in 2014 and an ordinary synod in 2015. Now, the difference between these two types of synod is that an extraordinary synod basically consists of the heads of Episcopal conferences, while ordinary synods consist of wider representation from the Episcopal conferences, representatives of religious orders, congregations, and so on. Pope Francis's purpose in this process was to bring out more fully than in the past, the three dimensions that he considers essential to effective synodality. Listening, this mutual listening, Paresia, meaning boldness or frankness, and discernment. The first dimension, mutual listening. In order to promote mutual listening, Francis wanted to stimulate as much genuine consultation as possible. Consultation first of the faithful before the first synod in 2014, and then further consultation throughout the church after the second synod, before the second and longer synod, rather, in 2015 much wider consultation than there had been in any synod before. And the point of the second consultation was to try to achieve further and deeper reflection than the first. The aim was to ensure that a more mature and fruitful discussion would result in the second synod 2015. And that was in fact what happened. And it reminds me of something of great importance in the conciliar process that developed at Vatican II. The periods of roughly nine months of Vatican II between each session were periods that allowed, in the light of the session just ended, time for reflection and discussion, and time for the revision of draft documents in the light of the council debates. That made the following session far more fruitful than would otherwise have been the case those intercession periods were crucial to the success of Vatican II. Going back to the two-stage synod of 2014 to 2015 that I've just outlined was not the only decision by Francis that made the synodal process more dynamic. He also decided that instead of the synods beginning with each bishop making a speech, which is a long and laborious process that rather limited interaction and dialogue, the bishops were now asked to submit their presentations two weeks before the synod. The meeting would then begin with a summary of these presentations, leaving time for far more interaction than had been the norm. Next slide. The second dimension, paresia, the Greek word meaning boldness or frankness or honesty. The listening dimension of synodality, which must include real and genuine consultation, also requires the dimension of frank, honest speaking, paresia, if this listening is to be fruitful. Now, there's a slide here 
which I love. It is the slide where you see Malala Yousafzai, the Pakistani girl who was standing up for education of girls, was shot in 2012 in Pakistan. And then at the age of 16, you see her here at the United Nations, the Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General that time on the left. And this girl with an honesty and a courage and a purity of spirit, speaking truly Parisia. It also reminds us just on passing that the spirit of God blows where it will. As Pope Francis prepared for the two-stage process on the family, he had in mind a determination, he's a pretty determined man, to raise and openly discuss something that was a major issue for many married couples and their pastors, an issue of which he was vividly aware from his pastoral experience in Latin America, as well as from the recently recent debates at the 2005 Synod on the Eucharist at that time. The issue was the question of access to Eucharistic communion for the divorced and remarried. Now, since statistics indicated that Catholics in many parts of the world were getting remarried in more or less similar numbers as the rest of society, this was a matter that could not be swept under the carpet. Many of the remarried wanted to put the problems of their earlier marriages behind them and make full participation in the Eucharist central to the practice of faith for them and their families. The problem, as you know, was that by church law, they were not allowed to go to communion. In practice, however, there was often a gulf between theory and practice, and there were wide disagreements as to what should or should not be allowed. The general direction in which Francis was inclining had become clear in 2013, the first year of his pontificate. In response to questions from journalists on the plane returning from the World Day of Youth in Brazil, he said, I believe this is the time of mercy, that is Francis. The church is a mother. She must reach out to heal wounds. This time is a kairos of mercy. And in Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he had written, the Eucharist, as you see in the slide, the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. And I just wanted to include a slide from the Congo reminding us of the worldwide church we're talking about in these talks. Now, aware there were widely differing views among bishops about how to deal with this issue, Francis decided to have everyone face it rather than leaving it festering beneath the surface. He knew that Cardinal Walter Gasper, sorry, Walter Casper, held the view that while valid marriages remain indissoluble, there are conditions in which mercy could be shown to divorced couples who sincerely wanted to make their new marriage work. He asked Casper to address this question of the Consistory of Cardinals in February 2014. Casper warned there would be strong reactions if he addressed the Cardinals on the topic. But Francis knew this. And indeed, there were very strong reactions from some against Casper's view. I would have been very worried if there hadn't been intense discussion, Francis commented afterwards. The cardinals knew that they could say what they wanted, and they presented different points of view, which are always enriching. Open and fraternal debate fosters the growth of theological and pastoral thought. I am not afraid of this, said Francis. On the contrary, I seek it. We have there a very clear statement of what Francis has in mind when he speaks of Paresia. It is very different to the approach that predominated in the pontificates of two good men, his immediate predecessors. The stark degree to which Francis's approach was different became evident at the opening of the extraordinary sin in October 2000. 14. One general and basic condition, Francis said to the assembly bishops, is this, speak out. Nobody should say, I can't say this, 
or they will therefore think this or that of me. In words that combined the way he saw real, genuine listening on one side and speaking openly and frankly on the other as two necessary sides of the same coin, the Pope referred to a letter one cardinal had written to him following the heated debates occasioned by Casper's presentation in that February consistory. Francis quoted the letter, which said, some cardinals didn't have the courage to say certain things out of respect for the Pope, believing the Pope may have thought differently. That was not good, declared Francis. That is not what synodality is about. We must say everything we need to say in the spirit of the Lord, without pusillanimity and without fear. At the same time, we must listen humbly and embrace with an open heart what our brothers tell us. You're talking about the cardinal, so no sisters there at the time. These two attitudes express synodality. A third dimension, discernment, which is a word that expresses the overall approach, as you probably know, of Pope Francis as a Jesuit to spirituality and to life. As someone who has guided many people over the years through spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, he seeks to exercise discernment in the midst of every activity and in all situations. And discernment means seeking to listen to, to be sensitive to, the way the Holy Spirit is moving our minds and hearts in the midst of everyday life. As the American Jesuit Ralph Martin puts it, discernment is the practice of making decisions in a prayerful way, which takes into consideration not only the gospels and church teaching, but also the way that God works through all of us individually. We reflect on what insights and impulses might be coming from God and which may not be. In discernment, he said, we use both our heads and our hearts. Discernment. Communal discernment in this case is also central to Francis's vision of becoming a truly synodal church. In his address in October 2015, celebrating 50 years since Paul VI established the Synod of Bishops, he said, a synodal church is a church of listening. It is mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn, everyone. The faithful, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, each listening to the others. Remember what Roberta said in her prayer. And all listening to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to know what he says to the churches. In other words, a synodal church is a discerning church in which everyone listens to each other and in and through this listening, seeks to be attentive to the Holy Spirit. In his book, Let Us Dream, Francis speaks explicitly of the discernment that resulted at the end of the 2015 Synod on the Family after much discussion. He referred to positions that to his regret had favored rather for and against attitudes and encouraged debilitating conflict, resulting, he said, in each side being entrenched in their truth and imprisoned in their own positions. However, referring to the approach that eventually found wide agreement in the Synod's final document, he said, the spirit saved us in the end, in a breakthrough at the close of the second meeting on the family by turning to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. And he explained, because of the immense variety of situations and circumstances, in which people find themselves, Aquinas is teaching that no general rule could apply to every situation, allowed the Synod to agree on the need for a case-by-case -case discernment by attending to the specifics of each case, attentive to God's grace operating in the nitty-gritty of people's lives. It's a wonderful sentence there to believe that sentence, attentive to God's grace, operating in the nitty gritty of people's lives, our lives. 
Thanks to this, we could move on from a black and white moralism that risked closing off paths of grace and growth. It was neither a tightening nor a loosening of the rules, but an application of them that left room for circumstances that didn't fit neatly into categories. Five years ago in April, 2016, Pope Francis published the apostolic exhortation, Amoris Letizia, the joy of love. And this document, which gathers together the fruits of the two synod process of 2014, 2015, is one of the longest papal documents ever written. There's certainly not time this evening to go into this document in depth, but I would, if you haven't already, I would commend it to your reading and prayerful reflection. The more I go into it, the more I'm convinced that Amoris Laetitia, the joy of love, will be right up there with other great documents engaging both heart and head that Francis has given to the church. Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti, Gaudete ed Exultate, and so many others. For Francis, in all his teachings, as in his life, the first and living rule is the person of Jesus Christ. His humility, his gentleness, his joy, and his love. And that is the spirit that permeates the pages of Mordis Laetitia. As Francis himself says, and you have it there, our teaching on marriage and the family cannot fail to be inspired and transformed by Christ's message of love and tenderness. Otherwise, it becomes nothing more than the defense of a dry and lifeless doctrine. Accompaniment, accompaniment is a word that springs out of the document. I sincerely believe, says Francis, that Jesus wants a church attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness. You can see that in the slide. Now, there's great depth in that seemingly simple statement. Great depth. France is inviting us to be attentive, discerning to goodness wherever it is found. As Ignatius Loyola used to say, to find God in all things. As Francis says in Gaudete et Exultate, Rejoice and Be Glad, a lovely document, if we let ourselves be guided by the Spirit rather than our own preconceptions, we can and must try to find the Lord in every human life. Francis's hope, as expressed in Amoris Laetitia, is for a church that is a sign of mercy and closeness wherever family life remains imperfect or lacks peace and joy. And he advocates, above all, a pastoral discernment filled with merciful love. In Amoris Laetitia, the church has a beautiful and valuable resource. I mention this because it's enlightening and encouraged to see in a pastoral outreach which has been made by the Dicastery on Laity, Family and Life five years after the publication of Amoris Laetitia that a synodal process focused on this or that, as was the two-stage synodal process of the Synod on the Family, can be a process that has its own internal dynamism. A dynamism that does not close with the end of a synod but that continues to be fruitful in the life of the church. In all of this, we see sodanity in action. Besides the synodal event of 2014-2015 with the two closely linked synods, there have been two other synods held by Pope Francis prior to the synodal process. He's now initiated for 2001 to 2023. They are, of course, the Synod of Bishops in 2018 on Youth, and the Special Assembly in 2019 of the Synod of Bishops of the Pan-Amazonian region that covers almost eight or nine countries on the theme Amazonia, New Paths for the Church and for Integral Ecology. You will find it, if you haven't already, very worthwhile to go into these two synods in depth. This evening, I'm going to select just three important aspects or themes from among the many that those rich ecclesial experiences open up. 
always remembering that these synodal experiences at their best point us towards signs of the times that the church is called to discern to new situations and challenges while remaining faithful to the call and mission given it by Christ. The first feature or point to which I would call your attention concerns our reflection on the development of synodality itself. It's a feature that illustrates yet again the intention of Pope Francis to move away from the monarchical model that was predominant in the church in earlier times. He is seeking to move the entire church towards a synodal model, a style of being church, whereby a process of continuing and widespread discernment leads us to the action that necessarily issues from that discernment. We have seen in these talks that it had become customary since the Synod on Evangelization in 1974 for the Pope to gather what he judged to be the fruits of the Synod and bring it all to closure through his authoritative interpretation in an apostolic exhortation. But at the end of the Amazonian Synod, Francis did not follow that pattern. Indeed, instead, he did something that at first sight might seem to be merely a technical matter of little importance. It was in fact quite deliberate on the part of Francis and potentially very significant. Instead of his apostolic exhortation, Querida Amazonia, which means the beloved Amazon, representing a papal act closing the synod proceedings, he did three things that leave that particular synodal process open to further and ongoing development. Firstly, he said, I will not go into all the issues treated at length in the synod's final document, nor do I claim to replace that text or duplicate it. Secondly, he said something I find very refreshing. He said he wanted to quote, to present the conclusion of the synod, which benefited from the participation of many people who know better than myself or the Roman Curia, the problems and issues of the Amazon region, since they live there, experience its sufferings and love it passionately, he wanted to present the conclusions of the Synod itself. Francis is stating there that the center can, and indeed must, learn from the many-sided periphery. Thirdly, he added, I have preferred not to cite the final document in this exhortation, because I would encourage everyone to read it in full. Note this. The Pope invites, this may seem technical, but it's very significant. The Pope invites everyone to read his exhortation and the final document. And we hear something that is distinctive of Francis's approach, that of setting processes in motion and then allowing time for these processes to mature to the point where discernment and decision can be reached. This is not kicking problems into the long grass or kicking the can down the road, as they say in the States, but allowing processes to develop. <clears throat> the second feature to which I would draw your attention, looking at these two synods, is a feature that emerged strongly at both the Youth Synod and the Amazonian Synod, namely, the growing recognition across the church that the voice and participation of women in the church must find effective recognition. Let me just add that if you look at the plenary council which has been going on in Australia, that's been said very, very strongly, for example, by uh, the Bishop of the Archbishop of Brisbane and others the recognition of the importance of focusing on this question. It's the second feature, the growing recognition of crotch the church that the voice and participation of women in the church must find effective 
recognition. Already on December the 8th, 1965, in his address to women at the close of Vatican II, Paul VI had said, the hour is coming, indeed has come, when the vocation of woman is being achieved in its fullness. The hour in which woman acquires in the world an influence, an effect, and a power never hitherto achieved. Well, 53 years later, in 2018, the final document of the Synod of Bishop on Youth offered an unequivocal echo to those words. The young also clamor for greater recognition and greater valuing of women in society and in the church. Many women play an essential part in Christian communities, but often it is hard to involve them in decision-making processes, even when these do not require specific ministerial responsibilities. Netsin had said, the absence of the feminine voice and perspective impoverishes, impoverishes debate and the church's journey, depriving discernment of a precious contribution. The Synod therefore recommends that everyone be made more aware of the urgency of an inevitable change. Well, that clear statement to a rather ironic light upon a particular aspect of this Synod on Youth. Among the representatives of religious present at the Synod, two of the male superiors representing their religious congregations, there were quite a number, but there were two who were non-ordained religious brothers. And they were recognized as members of the Synod with a vote. However, seven women religious superiors, representatives of their congregations, were also present, but they were not recognized as members of the Synod with a vote. As you can imagine, this discrepancy occasioned a considerable deal of negative comment. In 2019, the year following the Youth Synod, the final document of the Amazonian Synod in Articles 99 to 2103 was even stronger and more specific in its call for the recognition of women. The voice of women, it said, should therefore be heard. They should be consulted and participate in decision-making and in this way contribute with their sensitivity to church synodality. And these were the bishops saying this. We value the role of women, recognizing their fundamental role in the formation and continuity of cultures in spirituality. I think that's absolutely true in communities, and families. In order to make the point even more clearly, the Amazonian bishops went on, and it's there in your slide. Women's leadership must be fully assumed in the heart of the church, recognized and promoted by strengthening their participation in the pastoral councils of parishes and dioceses, and also in positions of governance. The bishops then asked that the ministries of Lecter and Acolyte be opened to women. And Pope Francis responded positively to this in a motu proprio in January this year. They also asked, in the new context of evangelization and pastoral ministry in the Amazon, where, and listen to this, this is the bishop speaking, where the majority of Catholic communities are led by women, we ask that an instituted ministry of women community leadership be created and recognize as part of meeting the changing demands of evangelization and care for communities. Here too, Pope Francis has responded affirmatively by instituting for the universal church in May this year, the new ministry of catechist open to women and to men. An important act on Francis's part because it is an explicit recognition of lay leadership in many communities and situations. And finally, in the many consultations carried out in the Amazon, said the bishops, the fundamental role of religious and lay women in the church of the Amazon and its communities was recognized and emphasized given the wealth of service they provide. In a large number of these consultations, the permanent diaconate for women was requested. This, they said, made it an important theme during the Synod. Well, Pope Francis, has established a new commission to study this question. 
And whatever decision eventually emerges regarding the diaconate, one thing is clear. The process of synodality, as seen in both the Synod on Youth and the Amazonian Synod, has expressly, expressly raised the question of how to quote, the leadership of women may be more fully assumed in the heart of the church. And that's a question that seeks and requires a constructive answer as the synodal path develops in the years ahead. The third feature focuses our attention on a matter that recognize it or not and like it or not, touches every one of the almost 8 billion human beings on our planet and indeed all life on our planet. We are of course talking about climate change and all the other aspects of the environmental crisis in our time. In this sense, the Amazon Synod should be seen as a kind of son and daughter of the encyclical Laudato Si. And even then that's a humorous slide I offer you, it really does express the reality of what is approaching. The final document of the Amazon Synod contained a series of proposals that go far beyond our possible considerations this evening. Overshadowing everything at the Synod were the many threats facing the ecologically critical biome that is constituted by the Amazonian basin. If you had not had a chance to read the final document of the Amazon Synod and Pope Francis' apostolic exhortation, Querida Amazonia, Beloved Amazon, which is by far the most lyrical of Francis's documents to date and evidently deeply heartfelt, then I would urge you strongly to take up both. Behind both and at the heart of the Amazon Synod stands Article 139 of Laudato Si, which presents the meaning of integral development, a concept central to the Christian vision of this Pope. We are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, he says, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. And strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. In Querida Amazonia, Francis commented, in a cultural reality like the Amazon region, where there is such a close relationship between human beings and nature, daily existence is always cosmic. Setting others free from their forms of bondage surely involves caring for the environment and defending it. The Lord, who is the first to care for us, teaches us to care for our brothers and sisters and for the environment which he daily gives us. This is the first ecology that we need. As we contemplate the UN's COP26, due to begin in Glasgow in 11 days time, the danger of a gradual climate catastrophe around the globe, considered by many scientists to be arriving sooner than was anticipated, threatens every kind of life as the present century develops. And to use that rather eccentric, image of a train, but thinking of a train, the climate crisis train has long since left the station. And it's now gathering momentum. That train is gathering momentum. It's rapidly gathering momentum. Care for our common home and integral ecology is truly a sign of the times, a sign applied by the Synod to the Amazonian region in a special way, a sign that speaks to all our brothers and sisters, children of the father who so loved the world that he sent his only beloved son. I'm running out of time. We're starting a bit later than anticipated, so please forgive me. I'm running out of time and I'm in danger of abusing your patience, forgive me. Before closing this last of my Mary Beaufort Institute talks on synodality, my mind goes back to the man who set the Synod of Bishops in motion, Paul VI. On the 28th of July, 1978, I was in Castel Gandolfo, that's what you see on the right of the slide, the papal residence in the Alban Hills, 
I was in Castel Gandolfo together with five colleagues from the Vatican Department for Interreligious Dialogue and 15 or so Buddhist leaders and Shinto leaders from Japan. Shinto, you know, being the most ancient religious tradition of Japan. We had been meeting together for four or five days of dialogue at a house of the Divine Word, Father Missionaries, in the Alban Hills, not far from Castel Gandolfo. And we've been invited to conclude the meeting in a personal audience with Paul VI, who you see there. The Pope welcomed us and spoke with each of us. And I can never forget his closing words. I thank you all, he said, for having given me the opportunity to love you and to serve you. The opportunity to love you and serve you. Words that had the ring of truth in them when spoken by this man. He died at Casa Gondol from a heart attack 10 days after our meeting with him. That was the person who set the contemporary process of synods and synodality in motion in September 1965, a man who was and is a saint. May his intercession, and that of all the saints, including John the 23rd and John Paul II, accompany us all in the present synodal process. To close, and you'll be happy to hear I'm getting to the close, I want to turn to Mary, Mother of God. I want to do this, perhaps rather eccentrically, through two images of her. First, many of you will be familiar with the image of Mary, untire of knots, a devotion to Mary that is very dear to Pope Francis. He took it back with him to Argentina after a period of study in Germany. It's an image that might perhaps bring a smile to our faces while also contemplating the many knots that will have to be untied and serious obstacles to be overcome in the coming years along the synodal path. And we can entrust the synodal path to the intercession of Mary, untire of knots. I also want to turn to the intercession of the same Blessed Virgin Mary, presented here by an icon of great depth and beauty, the famous Our Lady of Vladimir, the Theotokos or God-bearer. This icon, beautiful icon, has long been venerated by the Orthodox churches. May Mary intercede for us and the synodal journey but also on the eve of COP26, may she intercede in a special way for all the efforts in these days, months and years to heal and save our planet, humanity's common home. Thank you for your really great patience.